Angel or Tony Torres was a young man whose disappearance in 1999 has left his family and community seeking answers for decades. Angel, affectionately known as Tony, had a zest for life that was infectious. What could possibly lead to the disappearance of Tony Torres from the quiet streets of Biddeford, Maine? Was it the undercurrents of racial tension, a secret knowledge of unsolved crimes, or something more sinister at play? Did or does someone know something they want to keep a secret? Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mystery Stories. Born to Puerto Rican natives Ramona and Narciso Torres, Tony grew up during a tumultuous time in New York City's history. The Torres family's decision to move from New York City to Maine was driven by a desire for safety and a better quality of life. The 1980s in New York City were challenging times, with the city grappling with economic struggles, a surge in crime rates, and the devastating impact of the crack cocaine epidemic. The streets were often unsafe, and the future uncertain. For Ramona and Narciso Torres, the well-being of their children was paramount, and they sought a place that could offer a sense of security and community that New York could not provide at the time. In 1985, they made the bold decision to relocate to Denmark, Maine. This serene town, nestled among forests and lakes, was a world away from the frenetic pace and dangers of the city. It was here that Angel Tony Torres, a vibrant and outgoing young man, could explore his interests in a safe environment. Tony was known for his charismatic and friendly nature, easily making friends and becoming a beloved member of his new community. He was actively involved in sports, showcasing his athletic abilities on the soccer field and basketball court. His passion for music was evident as he immersed himself in the rhythms of salsa and the melodies of popular music, often sharing this love with those around him. Tony's personality was a blend of his urban roots and the nurturing influence of Maine's tranquil setting. However, his life took an unexpected turn when he vanished on May 21, 1999, after traveling from Massachusetts to Biddeford, Maine, at the end of his junior year in college. Tony Torres was last seen in the early hours of May 21, 1999, in Biddeford, Maine. On that fateful day, Tony had traveled from Massachusetts, where he was living at the time, to visit friends in Biddeford. The night of his disappearance, he was reportedly on South Street in Biddeford. The investigation into Tony Torres' disappearance has been long and arduous, with detectives tirelessly following leads for over two decades. From the outset, the circumstances surrounding Tony's vanishing pointed towards foul play. The abrupt nature of his disappearance, the last sighting on South Street in Biddeford, and the lack of subsequent credible sightings all suggested that Tony did not leave of his own volition. Over the years, detectives have pursued various leads, hoping to uncover new evidence that could shed light on the case. They have interviewed numerous individuals, revisited the scene multiple times, and worked with forensic experts to analyze any potential clues. Despite their efforts, the case remains unsolved, leaving Tony's family and the community with lingering questions and a yearning for closure. The dedication of law enforcement to this case reflects the broader commitment to solving missing persons cases no matter how much time has passed. After spring break, Tony went back to school to finish his junior year. A couple of months later in May, he got a summer job as a waiter. He also leased an apartment off campus with his girlfriend, Beth. They took a big step and went to Denmark to meet Tony's family for Mother's Day weekend. After a nice weekend with his family, they returned to Boston to prepare for their move. About a week later, Tony called his parents to wish them a happy anniversary on May 19, 1999. His mother joked with him, saying, One day it'll be you celebrating your own anniversary. 
Tony said he'd call back in a few days because he and Beth had just moved into their new apartment in the small town of Bear, Massachusetts, and their new landline phone service wasn't set up yet. However, there was something Tony didn't mention to his mother at the time of this phone call. He was actually in Maine, not Massachusetts. About a week later, Ramona answered the phone, hoping it might be Tony. She hadn't heard from him, but she knew he was busy with his new apartment and job. Instead of Tony, it was Beth, his girlfriend. Beth asked Ramona if she'd seen Tony assuming he was with his parents. He had missed his shift at his new job in Massachusetts, which was unusual for responsible Tony. Beth thought maybe something had come up while Tony was in Maine, and he forgot to call. Ramona told Beth she hadn't seen Tony since Mother's Day weekend, and they hadn't planned for him to visit. But Beth insisted that's not what Tony had told her. She said she had dropped him off at the bus station in Boston, heading to Maine, on Wednesday the 19th, the day of his parents' anniversary. Narciso and Ramona tried to stay calm, but they couldn't help worrying. Tony often visited Maine to see his old school friends in Biddeford, just an hour's drive from his parents' house. It seemed strange that he hadn't even mentioned being in Maine or dropped by to say hello, but Tony was 21 now, and he didn't need their permission to go anywhere. However, something didn't sit right with Beth calling to look for him, especially since he had missed work. So, they decided to file a missing persons report, and the search for Angel Antonio Torres began. After a short investigation, the police learned that Tony was reportedly seen in the vicinity of what used to be Jim and Renee's market on South Street on May 21, 1999. This area became a focal point in the investigation as detectives tried to piece together the events leading up to his vanishing. State police said he had come to the area from Massachusetts to sell drugs with a man named Jason Carney, also known as Jay, which might explain why Tony had been secretive about this trip with his family. Jay had told investigators they were at a friend's apartment in Biddeford before going to meet up with, quote, clients who had been unhappy with the quality of drugs they had bought earlier in the night. Police said Jay had returned to the friend's apartment upset, disheveled, and without Tony. Believe Jay Carney was less than truthful in providing accurate information and details of the events surrounding Tony's disappearance, and felt he knew of Tony's demise and of his location. Tony was last seen at a friend named Brandy's house party in Biddeford on Friday night, May 21st. According to witnesses at Brandy's party, Tony and Jay left her apartment on foot around 2 a.m. claiming they were going for beer, but others suspected it was drug-related. It was no secret that Tony was in town to sell drugs. He and Jay had been busy selling drugs around Biddeford, Old Orchard, and Sacco, Tony's old hangout spots, for the past few days. When Jay came back to the house without Tony, he seemed distressed. Brandy, who used to date Tony, noticed Jay's jittery behavior and how uneasy he appeared. He seemed frantic, and his pants were rolled up and covered in mud and water. It made Brandy wonder why Jay would be wandering around in the muddy woods or near the nearby Seiko River in the middle of the night during a house party. When Brandy asked about Tony's whereabouts, Jay responded with a nonchalant answer, grabbing himself another beer. Despite Brandy's insistence, Jay simply stated that Tony had left. He went on to explain that they had walked to a nearby grocery store, Jim and Renee's Market, where Tony got into a red pickup truck and departed for New Hampshire. Brandy couldn't understand why Tony would leave just like that and had a lot more questions, but she noticed Jay was getting angry, a sign she shouldn't push further. To stay safe, she stepped back and let Jay, who was still wet and muddy from earlier, drink his beer and not anger him any more than he appeared. Jim and Renee's market, sometimes referred to as the Whistle Stop, was at 328 South Street in Bidford, just a short walk from Brandy's place. If it was anything like Jakey's Market, which now operates from that same address, it would have been closed long before 2 a.m., even on a Saturday night. Investigators managed to extract some more details from him, 
although not a lot more information. He mentioned that on the night of Saturday, May 21st, 1999, he and Tony planned to meet with individuals who were dissatisfied with the drugs they had sold them earlier that day. He explained that a red truck arrived to pick up Tony, and he himself was seeking a ride back home to his parents' house or to North Conway, New Hampshire. However, he claimed he didn't know the identity of the truck driver or what occurred afterward. He returned to the party around 2.30 a.m. In exploring the case of Tony Torres' disappearance, potential external connections or enemies may hold some significance. According to reports, Tony was a sociable individual with an upbeat personality, but his popularity, particularly among young women, caused friction with some of his male peers. His father, Narciso Torres, recalled instances where Tony's interactions with white girls led to racial tensions, suggesting that these interpersonal conflicts could have escalated. The racial dynamics of the time and place cannot be overlooked. While Maine was generally considered safer than New York City during the 1980s and 1990s, it was not immune to racial prejudices and tensions. Reports of neo-Nazi activity and hate crimes in Maine, including in Biddeford, have surfaced over the years, indicating that racial animosity was present in the state. These factors, combined with Tony's own experiences as described by his father, suggest that racial tensions may have played a role in his disappearance. The disappearance of Tony Torres has also been surrounded by various theories regarding possible motives. One prevailing theory suggests that Tony's disappearance may have been drug-related. In 2016, state police disclosed that Tony had traveled from Boston to Biddeford with another man to sell drugs. The pair reportedly met with unhappy clients, and the other man, who we know as Jay, returned to a house party alone, appearing upset and disheveled. Another theory is that Tony may have been targeted because of his alleged knowledge about the unsolved murder of Ashley U. Late, a psycho teen. Moreover, two months before his disappearance, Tony had mentioned to his parents that he knew who was responsible for the murder of Ashley U. Left, a local teen whose case also remains unsolved. This revelation hints at the possibility that Tony may have had knowledge of criminal activities or individuals that could have put him at risk. These theories while unconfirmed, point to a complex web of personal conflict and hidden agendas that could have played a role in Tony's tragic disappearance. The investigation remains open, and detectives continue to seek information that could lead to a resolution. Jay Carney, who was indeed with Tony Torres on the night of his disappearance, as a key figure and a witness in this missing person case, Jay's account of the events could have provided crucial information to the authorities in finding Tony. However, his untimely death due to an overdose in 2015 meant that any knowledge he had of what happened to Tony that night went with him to the grave. The lack of concrete information from Jay has been a significant obstacle in solving the mystery of Tony's fate. His death without revealing the full story has only deepened the situation and the Torres family's anguish. In 2004, the family had Tony legally declared dead. Ramona and Narciso Torres have been steadfast in their efforts to keep the memory of their son, Angel Tony Torres, alive following his mysterious disappearance in 1999. They have faced the unimaginable task of living without closure for over two decades, yet they have never ceased in their pursuit of answers. The couple has made many heartfelt pleas to the public, urging anyone with information about their son's fate to come forward. They have expressed their enduring love and the constant presence of Tony in their thoughts, emphasizing the profound impact his absence has had on their lives. In a bid to encourage people to share any knowledge they might have, Ramona and Narciso have offered a substantial reward. The reward, 
which has been increased over time, stands as a testament to their determination to find out what happened to their son, and, if possible, to bring him home. Their advocacy goes beyond just seeking answers. It's also about honoring Tony's life. They have created an angel memorial garden in the place where he played as a little boy, ensuring that his spirit continues to be celebrated and remembered. The Torres family's unwavering commitment to finding the truth serves as a poignant reminder of the enduring bond between parents and their child, even in the face of the greatest tragedies. So what are your thoughts about what happened to Tony on that night in May 1999? Of course I believe for certain that his friend named Jay absolutely knew what happened to Tony. Of course, my first instinct is that the drug deal that they did earlier in the day put them in a bad situation. And when Tony couldn't or wouldn't make it right with the buyers, he didn't realize who he may have angered. I don't understand why Jay was allowed to live and Tony went missing and presumed dead that same night. Plus, it is coincidental that it was Jay that is the same person that gave Ashley a ride that fateful night to the Sanborns' house. It also seems that Tony was, quote, good friends with the Sanborn brothers. I understand Danny Sanborn couldn't keep his story straight when questioned about Ashley's death plus the evidence found in Danny's car and the Sanborn home are hard to ignore. So, it's obvious Danny is no saint. He is a convicted felon with what has been reported to have a long rap sheet. But wait, did anyone take a closer look at this guy, Jay? I know he died from an overdose in 2015, but in both Tony's story and Ashley's story, Jay is the common element. How could that have been missed? To conclude, it's my understanding from other reliable sources that the Maine State Police are no longer talking. Both investigations are still unsolved, but they are no longer releasing records related to these cases. Lastly, while the parents assert that Tony was a bit of a ladies' man and that he certainly had a darker complexion than most of the people in that area, sadly, I was able to find that there were hate crimes committed in Biddeford even as recently as 2020. So a hate crime against a 21-year-old man of darker complexion in 1999 who seems to have been attracted to white women might have easily found himself in trouble in this area of Maine. This is truly a sad story for the family. And I do hope that maybe someday someone will come forward with information that would put the family's loss at rest. Rest in peace, Tony, knowing your story lives on long after you have disappeared. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos at least once a week. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other two videos on your screen. Thank you.